Now, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us um, today on our third session of the series of um, civil procedure made practical. Um, we, we have received such positive feedback over the past a few months after the last two, and we at LexisNexis are very glad that we could give back in some way. Okay, so today's session is on trial preparation and trial strategy. Um, we trust that you've already attended or viewed part one that was held in August and part two that was held in September in order to derive maximum benefit from today's session. These sessions are powered by LexisNexis, um, Lexis Library and Lexis Practical Guidance and the legislation and case law that we will discuss today can be found on these online platforms. Um, just, just a few notes. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A session. Hopefully we have enough time for that. Um, and can we ask for you to please pop your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And more importantly, we are going to have a poll at the end of or during the Q&A session Please, can you take a few seconds to complete this? It's very helpful to us to craft and deliver content that you find um, useful and relevant. And today we have a special giveaway as it is the last um, webinar in this series. We are going to give away a copy of Advocate Hussein's Practical Drafting Skills. Um, the winner will be announced after the Q&A session. Advocate Ismail has the... Um, book up in the air, you can have a look at it. Uh, yes, we will announce the winner at, after the Q&A session. Um, right, we're going to start now. Advocate Hussein has, yeah, I don't think he needs much introduction. Everybody's very familiar with him. He is uh, an author of our practical drafting skills, as I've just said. He's practical of um, e-discovery. He also um, authors for the civil procedure practice area on our online platform, LexisNexis Practical Guidance. Um, I've got to say, are you ready? Yes, I'm Over ready to you. go. Thank you. And welcome to everyone to this um, last session in these in the series. Um, it has been a popular series. Um, this one, this last one deals with the trial stage. Now we, we covered the pleadings and the pre-trial stages and so on. Now, as lawyers, as trial lawyers, um, this the thought of a trial can can give you problems. I mean, I know of practitioners, very seasoned ones, who still feel nervous before entering into a court. And they never get it out of their systems. The problem is that when you walk into a courtroom, you are actually performing in public. You, you've got an audience. You've got a judge, a very critical audience. You've got an opponent, you've got clients, and you've got the, the gallery. It is most people, and this includes most lawyers, are not comfortable performing in public. The spotlight's on you and you're under pressure to perform. Now, I told you that one never really gets over the nervousness, the uncertainty that goes with, with walking into a courtroom, but you can manage it. And that's what this, this course is all about. You need to manage your anxieties. You need to manage the butterflies when you get them. The best way to manage them is to be thoroughly prepared. There is no substitute for being thoroughly prepared for have done your job. And the techniques I'm going to take you through now will, will help you to be very well prepared in order to present your case in a manner that is persuasive. Remember, this is an adversarial system. You win because you persuaded the judge. You didn't win because your client was truthful. Right? Don't, don't think that happens. It, you win because the judge 
you persuaded the judge to accept your client's version of what actually happened. So if we, let's start with, with the most basic thing. You, before you walk into any courtroom, be it tr a, for a trial, an opposed motion, or an appeal, you must know what the issue is. What is the question that the judge needs to answer? You need to know that. Under the current case management regime, we don't allow me, uh, the parties to go to court merely with the pleadings. Now, we know pleadings were, um, were meant to define the issues, but they never do. Pleadings are, the way people draft pleadings is quite, it's quite disturbing actually, because firstly, you'll find that it comes out of a, a, a precedent, okay? Even the office precedent, which is even worse. Um, secondly, it doesn't tell the judge enough about the facts of the case. What is the case about? And thirdly, the judge doesn't know what is the issue that requires a hearing. What is that issue which the parties couldn't settle, which requires a hearing? So under case management, we tell the lawyers, we want you to write down what you have agreed is the issues or are the issues between the parties. Those of you who are in Gauteng may be familiar with, the, in Johannesburg, we had a form a case management form um, where you had to write down the, what the issues are. In any event, part of the certification process is for the parties to agree on what the issue is. And you are supposed to confine the issue to that one or two questions which separate the parties. When you get to the trial court, in your opening statement, the first thing the judge will want to deal with is, tell me what are the issues? Why are we here at trial? And then tell me how you intend to present your case. Okay. Now, it, it makes perfect sense. You cannot resolve a dispute if you don't know what the dispute is about. It's as simple as that. Now, I spoke about the case concept previously. What you need to know now, I'm going to take you through some, some strategies which you need to, um, to deal with before you walk into court. Other issues as defined or as agreed between the parties compatible with your case concept. In other words, is other issues compatible with what your client says actually happened in the matter? Can you on the facts say the issues that represent what happened? And of course, the ultimate question, um, will my version persuade the judge to decide in our favor? You need to know the legal requirements of your cause of action, your claim, or the defense. What are the facts that prove those requirements. Now, if you go back to the to drafting particulars of claim, we discussed that. And in my book on practical drafting skills, I show you step by step how to draft in order to meet those requirements. Now, the most important thing for you as a trial lawyer is fact analysis. Now, I told you before that for a lawyer, trial lawyer, the facts are the most important. Not the law, it's the facts. If you are going to persuade a judge in a trial, it will be because the judge accepted your facts. The law is the easy part, okay? So you want to make a note of all the material facts you have to prove, bearing in mind the onus. Now, here's a, I'm going to give you a list. Number one, write down the material facts that are undisputed or admitted 
or where your opponent has no basis for disputing them. Now, this is a wonderful exercise. You have to sit down at your desk, uh, go review the statements of your witnesses, review the documentation, review the pleadings, and now write down all of the undisputed facts. Write down the undisputed facts you will have to prove to discharge the onus. And at this stage, you must start making up a list of witnesses who will present those facts to the judge. Now make a list of those facts which support your version. Now remember, in a proper dispute, some of the facts will support your version and other facts will support your opponent's version. Make a list of the facts that don't support your client's version. Now make a list of the undisputed facts that support your version. I made a note there. You do this so that you can present the facts to the judge who will make a finding of fact that favors your case. Now, this is an area which I find practitioners tend to overlook because they take things for granted. You know, they, they, they consult with the witness and think, ah, oh, no, no, this is a good witness. I'm going to call this witness. It's going to be good for our case. You need to do an analysis. Witness analyses are crucial. Look at your list of witnesses that you prepare in respect of each disputed fact. Now, remember, the trial is about presenting proof of the disputed facts. The, the undisputed facts are easily presented to the judge and the judge doesn't have to make any finding of fact. The judge merely introduces those undisputed facts into the record. The, undis the disputed facts is where you carry an onus and you have to provide proof of those facts. Now, what does proof of the fact means? It means you have to present proof to the satisfaction of the court. Um, now work out who will provide the evidence. Make a list of witnesses and next to, this is a method. So you write the names of the witnesses and then next to the name you write down just the main facts, the, the, the high points of the witness's evidence in next to the witness's name. So at a glance, you can see the name of the witness and, the, and what the witness is going to say in court. And you'll also be able to tell if the witness is going to be relevant and to which fact, okay? Then ask if I'm able to call these witnesses that if I call them, will it be sufficient to discharge the onus? You've heard that in, in the law of evidence, this thing called sufficiency of evidence. What that means is, look at the witnesses you have, look at the, the relevant facts that they can present to the court, and now say, if the judge accepts those facts, will I be able to discharge the onus? And that applies to plaintiff and defendant then do the sensible thing. Immediately establish with client if the witnesses are still available and willing to come to court without a subpoena. Um, forcing witnesses to come to court is not a good thing. They're not coming willingly and they might turn hostile. So check with your client. Now for each witness you call, you need the following documents. A statement from the witness, which you took down. And the statement must be in a chronological sequence. You must have a chronology document for each witness. You will use the chronology document to lead your witness in chief, rather than have the statement in front of you in court and use that to, to lead the witness in chief. That can get very messy and end. It doesn't flow because you're not sure where to go next. Whereas a chronology document in front of you, it may be 10 points. 
um, have it in large font in front of you and you will manage the witness so much better. You must also have a document where you write down the names of the witnesses in the order in which you're going to call them. You will make, you will first satisfy yourself that they will be available on the trial date. And then you will write down their names in the order in which you intend to present them in court. Now, here's the uh, rule number one. Always start with your strongest witness. Never start with, the, with, with your worst witness or a poor witness. If your strongest witness is not in court, well, ask for, a, for an, an, an adjournment or a stand down and go look for that witness. The mistake most practitioners make is that when their best witness doesn't, for some reason, doesn't turn up or is late, then they get forced by the judge or even by their opponents to call the next witness who is available. And that witness may not be your best witness. So be careful about this. You know, when your best witness, when you call a witness, your first witness, and that witness is bad or doesn't hit the mark, it creates a poor impression on the judge and you're on a slippery slope after that. There's the, the usual test. You only call witnesses whose evidence will be relevant to the issues. Remember relevance. It must be admissible. And most importantly, the version that the witness is going to present to the judge must be likely to have happened. It must be probable. Remember, the proof is on a balance of probabilities. If your witness's version is not likely to happen, the judge will not see it as a probability that he can take into account to discharge the onus. If you get that wrong, well, forget it. So the test for every witness must be relevant, must be admissible, must be probable. Practical thing, always look establish at an early stage if you will require an interpreter. You know the number of times, the, the amount of hours we waste in court because the attorneys and advocates are running around looking for an interpreter. Then you, you, you book an interpreter early. And by the way, interpreters are very much part of our trial scene. Um, you, you really cannot do without them because we're a multilingual society. So get the, a good interpreter book that interpreter, see that the interpreter is there at start time. Right, now let's look at why I have stressed the undisputed facts. I insist that you make a list of this. It is essential for you to make such a list. In this list, you will include those facts that your opponent disputes but does not provide a factual basis. Now, what does that mean? We all know as lawyers that sometimes an opponent will respond to your material fact by saying the allegations are denied, but they don't say why. They, in other words, it's a bare denial. Where you see a bare denial, you know it's because your opponent has no basis for the denial. They're just messing you around. Now, if you were smart, in the pretrial conference, you will deal with those things. You will ask your opponent, what, what, what is this bare denial? It's actually illegal. What is your factual basis for denying this fact? If they can't tell you, then you will say, OK, I'm going to, I'm going to lead evidence. And if you can't dispute it, I will ask for a cost order against you. Now put that on record, let the judge read the minutes. For a successful outcome, the undisputed facts are equally important. One of the values of the undisputed facts is that it helps the judge to work out the probabilities. So let's say there are two versions before the judge, plaintiffs and defendants. 
the judge can't say that either one as a witness or the other performed badly. So they're equally good. How does the judge work out which version, version to accept? Most judges will look at the probabilities of each version and then the probability, uh, the, the version which is more likely to have happened is the version the judge will accept. Now, how does the judge test the probabilities? The judge says, let's take the, undis the disputed facts and test them against the undisputed facts. If the undisputed facts support your client's version, you are likely to win. The opposite is true. If the undisputed facts don't support your client's version, you're going to lose. So this is how judges will resolve disputes of fact. Always measure the probabilities against the undisputed facts. Now, as important as the undisputed facts are, you don't dwell on them. You have to concentrate your mind on proving your version of the disputed facts. Focus on them, select your witnesses, select the the documents you need um, and the exhibits, the visual evidence that you'll pro uh, you will provide. If your, client's, if your client's version is not supported by the undisputed facts, you've got a problem, okay? Now here's a checklist, 12 point checklist for witnesses. Number one, is your witness relevant to the issue? Now, here's the thing. If the witness is not strictly relevant, don't call them. No, seriously, just don't. It's one way to irritate a judge. I've often seen in court when a witness is testifying for half an hour, the judge looks up and says to the counsel, Mr. Smith, why did you call this witness? I don't get it. What's the relevance? Is the witness's evidence admissible? If you, is it hearsay? If it is, then you know you've got a problem. Is the version uh, the, the witness intends to present, is, is it probable in relation to the undisputed facts and surrounding circumstances of the case? Does the witness testify from personal knowledge? That's very important. You would have, achieved, you would have checked all this when you consulted, but this is a useful checklist that you're going to use before you walk into court. Did your witness have enough opportunity to observe and present a, re a reliable recollection to the court? In other words, is this a reliable witness? And number six, very important. Can you support your witness with a contemporary document? Like the witness says, I delivered these goods to the defendant. Now you say, look at the document, number five in the bundle before you. What is that? The witness will say, that is the delivery note. That kind of contempor contemporary documentation is highly persuasive because they tend to be reliable and judges like them, okay? Do, can you support your witness with supporting evidence, like corroboration. Now I say, if necessary, you don't have to provide supporting evidence for every witness. We all know, for example, if the witness relies on an alibi um, or the witness says, I was not on the scene, then you need someone to support that. But when your witness is talking about a version of what happened during a contract or in a breach of contract, or even observing um, an incident. If that witness is good, you don't need to bring supporting evidence, okay? Check if your witness could be mistaken. The, the judge and your opponent will test that. So, so prepare, for, prepare for that. See, if, see for possible bias. Is there a motive? to testify, which can discredit the witness. For example, 
the witness might have an interest in the outcome of the case. Is the witness's version supported by the undisputed facts? Is the version contradicted by any undisputed facts? So there you have your 12 point checklist. Okay. Now, your own preparation checklist. As a lawyer, you need your own checklist. Did you do a proof analysis? What is a proof analysis? This is where you take each issue for trial. Ask yourself, what facts do I need to discharge the onus in respect of that issue? Who will be my witnesses? What documentation or other visual evidence will I need? Now, that is an exercise you have to do in preparation. If you don't, well, you're going to run into trouble. Where is the witness ranked in order of importance in, to, to your case? I told you, best, strongest witness first. Did you prepare a chronology for each witness? Now, I'll tell you, a chronology document for a witness works like magic. When you're preparing the witness in your office, in your chambers, have this chronology document, give it to the witness. Now tell the witness, I'm going to lead the evidence according to these events in that order. Now the witness will know what you want. The witness will be at ease. They won't be anxious about whether they left out something or where to go next. You'll be in control. Did, did you hand a copy of the chronology to the witness and explain, does your witness have access to a written statement? So the chronology document is one thing, but the witness should also read the full statement which you took in order to refresh them, uh, their minds. See that the witness has time to read the statement. Were you able to select the documents you will introduce with this witness? And did you flag it in court? Now, this, this is really basic stuff that people forget to do. Um, when you consult the witness in your chronology document, if there's a contemporaneous document, make a note of it and put in the number of the document in the bundle. So when you call a witness to the stand, you already flagged those documents. The worst thing to do is to say um, to the witness, did the defendant sign a document? Witness says, yes. Let me take you to the document, says the lawyer. And now he looks at the bundle and now he's shuffling, looking. Then he says, would your lordship bear with me? And then he's still looking. The witness is standing there feeling left out. I mean, it's just so unprofessional. Just don't do it. Flag it. You know, you should have these, these sticky thingies that, that, that we use, these, these things. Just use that, use different colors for each witness, and you must be able to find the document straight away. You must be able to say seamlessly, take a look at document number 14 in the bundle. Would your lordship turn? To, to page 14 of bundle A before your lordship. Done. That's what you want. Number nine, do you know your facts? Do you have a thorough knowledge? Do you know where each witness fits in? You have prepared a document with the main facts of the witness, arranged in a sequence, and you will use a quick reference while on your feet. So the chronology document can become your reference rather than the original statement. Because those things tend to be long and it might take you time to look for what you want, whereas a chronology document tells you immediately. You satisfy your, your, your self that the evidence um, will not fall foul of the rules of evidence and you are and constantly apply this test, relevant, admissible, probable, once you've ticked off all these boxes, you should feel better about going to court. So you're ready to, to go and, and, and appear. Now, here's the thing. 
You may have heard of this thing called over trying a case. I'm saying never over try a case. If, if your first witness turns out to be a credible witness and you've got three more witnesses waiting outside on the same fact set, don't call them. Just move on to another fact set. Tell the other two witnesses, thank you very much, we won't be needing you. If your, if your first witness went well and doesn't need corroboration, don't call the others. Keep it short. Judges get irritated when you call the next witness and the next witness is telling the judge exactly what the first witness told him. And he's going to say, but, but why I've heard this. Why do you need to tell me more? Now, this is a very important thing. Um, I know South African lawyers don't do it. I introduced this to lawyers 15 years ago. Many of them are doing it now, but not enough. It's called witness briefing. I say, in your practices, you must make it compulsory because it pays. Now imagine, you're the lawyer. You are feeling nervous about going to court. Imagine the witness. Witnesses, they lay people. They are nervous about going to court. Most people think if you go to court, you're in trouble, okay? And that's not really the case. So how do you manage this? Give them a briefing. What that means is you take them to court before the trial. You can do it early in the morning of the trial or on, on a day a couple of days or so before the trial. Take them into court, walk them around, show them the courtroom, explain who the role players are, show them the witness stand, tell them to stand in it, show them how to speak in which direction towards the judge, explain the recording system and so on. So people don't know this. Don't take it for granted, okay? You know, I even saw an attorney, and I mean, this is really weird, but I saw an attorney walk into court and he went up to the microphone and started doing this, testing, testing, testing. He thought it amplified sound. He didn't know it was, a, it was recording. I mean, it was quite hilarious. But you know, an, an attorney got, did that. Um, it was in Durban, by the way, so uh, <laughs> had to be. So, so if you tell the witness, stand in the box, feel the atmosphere, look, they are still going to be nervous, but you'll be able to manage the anxiety. Explain the procedure. The court orderly will call your name. You walk straight to the witness stand. The interpreter or the judge will swear you in. Explain how to take the oath. You'll be surprised at how many people botch that up and then they become nervous for the rest of the time. Now, I can tell you, um, when it comes to witness briefing, those countries that use the jury system have made witness briefing compulsory, even to the point where they will simulate a courtroom in the office and put the witness through the paces. Because how a witness performs in the witness box makes all the difference to a jury. The jury is made up of ordinary people, citizens who sit there and hear the case. The advantage we have is that we don't use a jury, but and the, the findings of fact are made by a judge who is a trained lawyer. There's a huge difference. But that doesn't mean the judge doesn't have to be impressed. You have to impress the judge. You have to persuade the judge. How your witness performs makes all the difference. So from now on, for God's sake, take time and do witness briefing. There are many firms who have trained staff to do witness briefing. So this person takes the witnesses along to court and shows them around 
and tells them what, 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 what will happen and it helps them, okay? And they perform better. Never underestimate this, okay? Now, here's another practical piece of advice. Just take it from me. A good set of heads is indispensable. I don't care what kind of case you're doing. I don't care if it's a very simple matter, good, sold, and delivered, or it's a, it's a, it's a motor car collision at a intersection. Ne never underestimate the value of good heads of argument. At this stage, you have a case concept, you identified the issue, you know where the onus lies, you know who the witnesses are and what they will say, we recommend that you start drafting heads now. In other words, while you're preparing, you are drafting heads. And the greatest benefit of heads is that there is nothing like writing heads to prepare you for the trial. While you're writing heads, you'll see the strengths, the weaknesses, and, it, it, and you'll find the gaps that you didn't see before. Now, you have a draft set of heads. When you get to court, the end of the trial, final, um, your final argument. Before that, you can, if, if you have to change your comments and your representations around witnesses, then you can amend your heads. And they're very easily done. You have a laptop in court, you can easily amend it. Go and print it at the attorney's association and you're ready to hand it up. But I can tell you these days, we, we get more and more inexperienced uh, lawyers coming to the bench. I mean, it's a fact. They are not capable or they're too nervous or not confident enough to give extempore judgments, okay? So I would say, 10 out of 10 cases, the judge will, will reserve judgment. They say judgment reserved, and that's where your heads play an enormous part. When a judge reserves and there's heads of argument in the file, that assists them and they rely on them. My last point there is that heads must never be lengthy, short, sharp, to the point. Simple trial, three page heads, that's all you need. Concise heads. Judges hate lengthy heads. You give the judge 50 pages of heads, ugh, it's not worth reading. Now let's get to the trial. The first point I make is that, please remember, you still have to make attempts to settle, okay? Um, you must, you are obliged to do so. We now have rule 41A, but we also have in some directives and cases around door settlements. Now, lawyers love door settlements. In fact, throughout my career, I've settled many, many cases at court, at the door. But in 100% of those cases, I knew already at the pre-trial conference months ago that we were going to settle. So why did the lawyers settle at the door? It's a scam because now they can charge for, for they know it's going to be settled. They have a settlement agreement in the bag, but now they settle at the door so they can get preparation time. They can get a trial fee and so on. Well, the game is up. The judges have have found out and they don't like it. If you settle at the door, you'll have to explain to the judge why you settled at the door. And look, sometimes you have to settle at the door. Then you must have an explanation for the judge. So be careful. You need to find out where your matter has been allocated. Now, that differs based depending on where you are in the country. In Gauteng, 
Gauteng is very different to every other division in the country. All the other divisions use a fixed role, which means when you apply for a trial date, you get a trial date, you are informed of the date, you guarantee the judge, you can start. In Gauteng, it's different. We set down around 124, sometimes 140 trial cases a day on the trial roll. And if you complied with the case management requirements and you are certified trial ready, you may get an advanced allocation. So the registrar will publish a list on which your case will appear and you'll be allocated to judge X, so you'll know. In the other divisions, you know that you've got a date and you'll know who the judge is, so it's not a problem. You have to introduce yourself to the judge, see the, and very important, see that at least the first two witnesses are there. They're sitting outside court, okay? The interpreter and stenographer must be present. I know this sounds silly, but man, do you lose time. I mean, I've seen, I've seen cases where we're all ready to start. Everyone's in place. All you have to do is call the judge, and then you realize the stenographer has disappeared. You know, they always disappear, so just be careful. Uh, always try and start on time. Uh, you, you know, it's not good for you as a professional person if you are late. And just, just make sure all the logistics are in place. Your, the attorneys are there, the advocates are there if you're using advocates, uh, witnesses are there, interpreters, stenographer, everything is in place. 10 o'clock, kick off. Also, check if the bundles are available. The bundle of the documents, and these days the bundle is thin. Gone are the days where we discovered everything in the court, in, in the office file, and you've got a bundle that's this size, you know, three lever arch files. You'll be penalized if you ever do that. See that the bundle is in the witness box. You know who's your first witness. Open to the page of the first document. Keep it open. So when the witness, you get to that point, you say to the witness, take a look at the document in front of you. And then say, my Lord, it's page eight in bundle B. Very, that, that works really well, okay? Now comes the opening statement. Now, I'm going to take you through some trial procedures, but this is not a trial advocacy course. That's another course, okay? Um, but I'm going to take you through some te basic techniques uh, that you must uh, observe. I'm going to make some suggestions. Firstly, judges hate lengthy opening statements. They are absolutely impatient to hear the first witness. So keep it short and to the point. Now, the judge would have read the papers before coming to court. What papers? The pleadings bundle, which will be particulars of claim, the plea, a pre-trial uh, conference, the minutes of case conferences, and if you use, depending on which division, they may be the trial certification documentation. So the judge now knows what your case is about. But I have a simple suggestion for you. You need to draft really well your particulars of claim, your pleadings, your plea. Because if you draft badly, the judge reads your bad draft in chambers before coming to court. The judge is unimpressed with you already. You're on the back foot before you started, okay? When you get to your feet, the first thing is to tell the judge what the case is about. So the nature of the dispute is, is before him. My Lord, this is a medical negligence case. Or my lady, this is a dispute around the breach of a contract. Okay, so something like that. I mean, it's just one sentence. And then explain what the agreed issues are. Now, for heaven's sake, if you have not agreed, well, don't call the judge until you talk to your opponent and say, listen, can we agree these are the issues? If you have one of those impossible opponents, well, you say, 
that's fine. I'll tell the judge you don't know. And just and then tell the judge. As far as you are concerned, these are the issues, but you were not able to agree with my learned friend, okay? And they always emphasize learned when you're criticizing your opponent. Then the judge knows what you actually mean is that fool over there. Now tell the judge, oh, sorry, hand in a chronology document. This works brilliantly. What is this thing? It's a document which sets out the whole version that you're going to put before court in a chronological sequence, indicating who the witnesses will be. Judges love it because they keep it in front of them and they consult it throughout the trial. Now tell the judge how you intend to run the case. Tell the judge, I'll be calling two witnesses. They are um, Mr. Brown, Mr. Green, and Mrs. Blue. So just tell the judge. And this is basically what they're going to tell your lordship. Deal with logistics. Uh, check if the judge has the correct bundles. Deal with any queries that the judge may have around those bundles. You, then you call your witness. And the way to do it is to have the witness ready. The witness has been through briefing. The witness knows what to expect and simply confidently walks into the witness box and there are no delays. Now we come to the evidence in chief. The first rule is the judge wants to hear the evidence from the mouth of the witness, not from your mouth. Lawyers tend to discredit their own witnesses by giving the evidence. And how do they do this? By asking leading questions. Now, I can tell you there are two strategies that your opponent will use. The one, your opponent will, will stand up and object and say, leading question. Now you have to rephrase, which upsets your train of thought. It's not good for you if your opponent continues to object and the objections are sustained. That's really bad for you. That's a one strategy. The other strategy is your will, opponent will sit there and just listen and let you lead the witness. In argument, he's going to say, but Mr. X did not give this evidence. My learned friend gave the evidence. Now, let me show you, my Lord. Look at all these leading questions. The witness said nothing. Your case is down the tube, okay? Okay, now keep in mind your case concept. Now, remember what happened according to your client's version is what helps you to present the case because that's what you want to tell the judge. And you tell the judge through witnesses, through documents, through visual evidence. You must have a chronology document for each witness in front of you. The worst thing you can do is read from a statement. Because when you're reading from a statement, you tend to get stuck in the statement, which means that you stop making eye contact with the witness and eye contact with the judge. Very bad technique, OK? Always lead your witness in sequence. You would have prepared your witness to do so. Keep the questions short. When you get the answer you want, move on. Okay. I just want to deal quickly with re-examination before I get to cross-examination. Because if you are the plaintiff's um, uh, representative, plaintiff's lawyer, at the end of cross-examination, the judge will ask you, do you have re-examination? All I'm saying is, it's better if you don't re-examine, okay? Um, it's very nice to stand up and say, no questions, my lord, and sit down. Judges like that. But if you are now going to re-examine in order to try and paper the cracks that appeared under cross-examination, you are just going to make matters worse, okay? Just don't do it. If you must re-examine, it has to be about a fact which emerged for the first time during cross-examination and it requires some clarity. That's it, don't re-examine otherwise. 
And I told you already, always call your strongest witness. If the witness goes well, you don't need any more. You must remain aware of your list of witnesses and your witness analysis. When you have, when you have the evidence you need, that's when you close. So what happens is you know the issue, you know the, dis the undisputed facts, you know the facts for which you have to pre present proof to the judge, the undisputed facts, you've presented your witnesses, you referred to the documentation, you presented visual evidence, you know, maps, diagrams, models. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that later. The worst thing you can do, and I promise you, lawyers do it all the time, and it's a source of irritation. It doesn't look good. Your last witness just testified. The judge looks at you and says, yes, next witness. And the lawyer standing there, shuffling paper, oh, will your lordship bear with me? This, this, would your lordship bear with me? It's just the worst thing. Just stop it. Okay. Would your lordship bear with me? What's happening? You're not sure if you covered everything. You don't know if you should call more witnesses. You don't know, maybe you ran out of witnesses. You're a bad lawyer when you do that. The worst thing to do, even worse than saying to the, to the judge, would your lordship bear with me? Is to say to your, to, would your lordship grant me a short adjournment? I need to consider my position. What is a judge thinking? Don't you know what your position is? Who do you need to, how are you going to check? Who are you going to consult? The way to do a trial, last witness steps down, confidently tell the judge, my Lord, that's the evidence in chief and sit down, okay? You make a good impression. If you ask for an adjournment and you come back and you say, my Lord, can we have an extra half hour we 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 considering our position and so on. it's just so bad. Don't do it. Right. Asking leading a witness in chief. Listen, this is not easy. Okay. It's easier to cross-examine because you get a lot of latitude. You can ask what you want. Your questions are rubbish, nobody notices. Leading in chief, that is not so easy. And you need to practice the art. Those of you who are going to be trial lawyers, I suggest you do a course in trial advocacy. By the way, it's, it's compulsory now in terms of the regulations six and seven. Um, th those regulations will be amended. It's gonna be compulsory for every uh, new practitioner to do trial advocacy. Sometimes next year we will announce the LPC will announce um, where you can attend these courses. Now, here's some suggestions. First thing, do not ask leading questions. Use simple questions, plain language. Plain language is very important. I don't know why some lawyers think they should try and sound like a lawyer, you know? I, I mean, I mean this, is a, this is a person, in, an ordinary person in the witness box but you will ask, um, what does the document say therein? Where's the therein coming from? Okay, it just confuses everyone. Um, do you see the document? Yes. Describe the document, tells the judge. What was your involvement? Simple, the, you, the, the witness is happy, you get the answer you want. Now the technique, the technique, is this, always first think of the answer. What is the answer that I want? Then ask a simple non-leading question to bring out the answer. I want to know who signed that document. That's, that's the answer I want. Now ask the witness, do you turn to page 15? Do you see a signature? Yes, whose signature is that? Okay, nice and simple. Judge gets it, witness gets it, everyone's happy. Now, setting the scene. I don't know why lawyers do this. They forget the judge wasn't there. So they ask witnesses about 
an incident without first explaining to the judge the scene, what happened, where it happened, how it happened. You need to set the scene. Now, when you're setting the scene, and that can happen in accidents, assault cases, arrest cases, in a, a criminal injuria case, and you know, um, in a building collapse, an engineering case, um, you have to set the scene for the judge. Now, what works really well are pieces of visual evidence. You must learn to use photographs, videos, uh, maps, diagrams, okay? Judges love it. It helps them to understand and they'll understand the evidence. Now, the, the problem that, uh, that many practitioners have, the witness is on the witness stand. Now, really bad lawyers do this. They will, they will ask a witness, uh, Mr. Smith, where were you on the 26th of October, 2020? The witness will tell you, I was at a particular scene. Tell the court what happened. So now the witness doesn't know where to start and what, what, what he must say. So he's going to start telling a story. Then he stops talking. The, the bad lawyer looks at him and says, and what happened next? Or, and then what happened? That's really bad. You have no control. All the irrelevant nonsense could come out. You could damage your case. You need to control the witness. One of the methods you can do use to control the witness is to use what we call the headlining method. In other words, tell the witness what you're going to ask. I'm going to ask you about a will that you witnessed. Now the witness knows what you're talking about. I want, to, I want you to, I'm going to ask you to explain to his lordship the scene of an accident that you, that you witnessed, okay? Now the witness knows. I'm now going to ask you what happened when the ambulance arrived. Right, now you ask. I'm going to ask you what happened after you delivered the goods to the defendant. And then you ask. So you give the witness a headline. That's not leading the witness, okay? So that's the one method. The other method is what we call piggybacking or looping. What, how that works is, in order to avoid leading the question, you ask your next question based on the answer to the previous question. Where do you work? I work at Checkers. What work do you do at Checkers? I am the storeroom manager. For how long have you been the storeroom manager? I've been there for 15 years. Uh, do you see? You, you listen to the answer and ask your next question based on that answer. And you see, when you've exhausted those answers, that's when you say the next heading. You say, I'm now going to move on to, and you tell the witness. It works very well. Always use a sequence, always use visual evidence, okay? Diagrams, sketches, photographs, models, um, like I've seen in many, um, personal injury cases where you use models of the heart or the, someone brings in a model of a spine and so on. Judges love it because it, it helps them to understand. You want to be in control. Avoid multifaceted questions. Don't ask a, don't ask a question that requires three answers. I mean, that's really bad. Open-ended questions, stop it. This thing about, and then what happened? What happened next? Tell the court, okay? You must be confident with your witness. That means you have to listen to your witness and behave like that's exactly what you want to hear, okay? You must never be antagonistic towards your own witness. And note the facts that come out, which the judge will accept, must support your case. When you start with a witness, establish credibility. 
In other words, what qualifies this witness to testify? What, what the, uh, was the person there? Did he witness? Is it his signature? That sort of thing. The judge needs to know where this witness fits in and why this is a credible witness. You must leave the background information. And the purpose is to show this witness has personal knowledge and will be helpful to the judge. Lead evidence that shows that the witness had an opportunity to observe. The witness has knowledge, personal knowledge, that there's a lack of bias, okay? Now, as a lawyer, don't be boring. For God's sake, you can, I've seen lawyers that are so boring. I wonder how the judges stay awake. Do not lead your witness in a boring monotone, okay? Um, the witness gives a crucial answer. That, that is my, is, sorry, that is the signature of the defendant. And you'll go, Mr. Smith, that's important. Tell her, her ladyship, whose signature is that? It's the defendant's signature. Okay. You're making it interesting. No, come on. The fact that someone signed a document is not, it's not exciting. It's not so interesting. But you can't be boring in court. That's what trials are about. Not it, you don't, you mustn't be, don't sound disinterested in your own witness, like. Um, and tell his lordship what happened. And while the witness is talking, you're busy shuffling papers, writing notes, having a talk with your clerk sitting here. That's just rubbish performance, okay? You need to hold the judge's attention. The evidence must sound interesting and you can make it sound interesting. Okay, good trial adv advocacy course will show you how to do that. Um, look, there are... <laughs> Unfortunately, some people are born with a boring monotone for a voice. I've, I've seen that. But here's the good news. You can fix it. We have um, voice clinics. I've, uh, we've sent many people to those voice clinics to fix their voices and their accents and the way they articulate. So they sound better in court and it works. Five weeks, about an hour a week, they fix you, okay? And you, they are all over the place. You must have seen them, voice clinic and so on. Google it, you'll find them if you, but, but for God's sake, if you want to be in court, fix your voice if it's not very good. Now we come to the next step, which is cross-examination. Here's the first rule. Never ask a question if you don't know the answer. That's the first rule. Second rule. You must know when not to cross-examine. And the third rule, if you do cross-examine, you must know when to stop. Lengthy cross-examination, the same questions repeated, you will lose the judge, okay? The purpose is to bring out evidence, facts that suit your case. If you're, which means if your opponent's witness does not damage your case, no need to cross-examine. When, when your opponent says evidence in chief, you, look, you stand up and you look at the judge as if, what on earth are these people doing? Well, my Lord, I have no questions for this witness. And you sit down and you look fed up. Why do they call this witness? Okay? So it's, this is how you run a trial. These are the purposes of cross-examination. And let me tell you straight. Cross-examination is not there for you to break the witness. Right? That only happens in, on television where the witness is reduced into a bowl of quivering jelly and has to be carried out of court after having confessed all to you. That doesn't happen in a real court. Real courtroom trials are actually pretty boring, okay? Now, if you run trials like that on television, no one will watch. You want to get facts favorable to your case. You want to challenge the truth and accuracy of the witness's version. You want to discredit the witness. You want to introduce your client's case uh, or give the witness an opportunity to comment on your client's version. 
You want to undermine the witnesses who are still going to testify. So you know there's two more witnesses. You can tell this witness, Mr. Jones is waiting outside. That's not what he says. So there's another good reason why, if your first witness goes well, don't call the others. And cross-examination is your, your first opportunity to parade your case. Only cross-examine if it's necessary. If it's not, don't cross-examine. If the witness does not damage your case, nor can the witness give you evidence that will assist your case, um, if the answer is no, the witness is credible, do not cross-examine it. Examine. You know, if a witness goes well for your opponent, doesn't really damage you, don't cross-examine because you can only make things worse, okay? Keep questions relevant and short. Short, sharp, leading questions. The worst thing you can do is repeat the evidence in chief to the witness. I've, I've seen lawyers do this all the time. They think cross-examination is where you repeat the evidence in chief back to the witness, but only in a louder voice. I mean, I mean come on, that's nonsense. Here's some tips. Make an assessment of the witness. Where do you do that? Listen to that witness's performance in chief. Is this a strong witness? Is this a witness that I must be careful of? Perhaps I should not cross-examine. Listen to the answers. Never argue with a witness. You always lose that argument, okay? Never be argumentative. If a witness tells you something that irritates you, don't fall for the bait. Just move on, okay? You never badger a witness in the box. One thing judges hate. Now, I'm serious. They really dislike it. When you are rude to a witness, when you badger the witness, when you're yelling at the witness, I've seen lawyers do that. They think they're performing wonderfully. Of course, the gallery think this is brilliant. It's like on TV. But that's not what the judge is thinking. The judge thinks you're a bully and you're a fool and I'm going to fix you. That's what the judge is thinking. And judges will never allow you to be rude to a witness. They'll call you to book every time. And it makes a bad impression. There's the big, this is the main thing. Ask only leading questions. If you don't know, don't ask, okay? You want to bring out facts, not conclusions, okay? You saw that the defendant was staggering. Yes. Now leave it, move on, don't say, so he was drunk. The witness will say, I don't know. I don't know why he was staggering. Maybe he was drunk, maybe he wasn't, maybe he tripped. And now you just damage the whole thing, okay? One fact per question. No multiple answer questions. Avoid the big words. Um, don't be ambiguous and confusing. Think before you ask. And always the question is, what the, the technique, what is the answer? Now put the answer in the witness's mouth. That's cross-examination, okay? You never ask a witness to explain. Don't ask questions with words like how, what, when, why. Describe, explain. The worst cross-examiner is the one who says to the witness, explain to his lordship what happened. Well, they're gonna dig your grave for you. That's what they do, what's gonna happen. Always think of the answer, then put the leading question. Never be vexatious and abusive and oppressive, discourteous, judges hate it. Aggressive cross-examination is not effective. Look, the, 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 the peanut gallery will be very impressed, but not the judge. And never mislead the witness under cross-examination. That's, that's unethical conduct. If you do it, you are going to get into trouble, the judge will report you. Don't ask questions that are irrelevant, okay? Don't get involved in collateral issues. 
you are allowed to repeat questions to a witness to test credibility. But if you excessively ask or repeatedly ask the same questions, the judge will intervene. The trick is to run through your cross-examination smoothly without intervention by the judge and without objections from your opponent. Don't elicit, elicit inadmissible evidence in, in, in your own favor. Um, be careful about what you ask. If you elicit unfavorable evidence in a legitimate answer to your question, it is admissible against you. So rules of evidence. If you elicit an answer that kills your case, tough luck, you are going down. So be careful. How do you avoid that? Think of the answer you want, ask only leading questions. If you ask the how, why, explain questions, you're going to get into trouble, okay? And stay away from collateral issues. They take up too much time and a judge will stop you, okay? Here's some final suggestions. Cross-examine cross only if the evidence is adverse to your case. If, you, if it's not, don't cross-examine. Now, before you cross-examine, you must know what you want from this witness. You've made notes, listening to the evidence in chief, the facts that are against you, you need to undermine. Just cross-examine on that, short, sharp questions, sit down. And never allow yourself to be deviated by your opponent. You know what some, some lawyers do? The, your cross-examination is going well. In fact, it's going too well for your opponent. Then they come up with spurious objections. Objection, and some nonsense comes up. Don't tolerate it. And here's the big problem. A witness says the defendant was drunk at the time. Now, you... The, what you want is for the witness is to undermine that. So you say to the witness, you don't know why this person's eyes were red. No. You, you did not smell his breath. You were too far away. Yes. You don't really know why he staggered. No. That's it, move on. Now you can argue that the witness couldn't tell if this person was drunk. But now, stupid cross-examiner. Well, this means that this person was drunk. And the witness will say, no, I don't think he was drunk. And you've just undid the whole thing. So never look for a concession. You know the witness will never make it. So how you lead your witness and how you cross-examine really determines if the, if the court is persuaded. And that is what adversarial trials are about. You need to persuade the judge. We are fortunate here, we don't use juries. They are far more difficult to persuade, okay. Now I'm, gonna run, I'm running out of time very quickly. Um, expert witnesses, this is now case managed. You, you can't just call witnesses anymore. You have to comply with case management. In other words, the usual summaries and opinions must be filed, but then the, wit the, two, the witnesses must meet, file a common minute. If it's not necessary to call them, you don't call them, okay? If you do have to call them, the joint minutes will say, this is where we disagree. You will lead the witness on that disagreement and the cross-examination will take place on that. So how you lead the expert and how you cross-examine, the same applies. However, under cross-examination, be careful with, with experts. You can easily ask a question that elicits an answer that's against you, okay? It is essential for you to stick to the technique of asking only leading questions and do not give the, ex the, the expert the scope to explain. 
Now the worst witness for the, for a what where answer or an or a question that's sorry what where question or a question that says explain is an expert because they will explain and they will give you an explanation that is adverse to your case. Now. Where are the areas that you can really cross-examine a witness? There's three of them. The investigation of the case at hand, the expert's methodology, and the opposing expert's conclusions. Now, I don't have time to go through this now, uh, but here, the, the, these are the, here's a guide. You have to research the subject matter. If you're cross-examining um, an expert reconstruct, a, a accident reconstruction expert. You need to know how they do it. You need to read some books. You need to consult your own expert, okay? Um, you need to look at the credentials. Generally, the lawyers here will call an expert who is a, an expert. Very often, I've really seen someone's credential, credentials being channeled, challenged. Always take the facts from that were presented to your opponent's expert and hand them over to your own expert and see what the response is. That, that's where the meeting of the two experts really work. Okay. Also, you can use your opponent's expert to obtain favorable concessions for your own expert, okay? That, that's a well-known technique. So you use the other expert, your opponent's expert, to affirm your own expert. L eliciting areas of agreement, that's quite easy. I mean, two experts in the same discipline, they're really not going to disagree with, the, with each other much, okay? Then look for bias, lines of reasoning, uh, some, some experts don't follow consensus. They have a maverick line. You need to, to check that. Procedure and protocol, very important for you, for you to look at. All experts, when they carry out tests, investigations, they have a set protocol that they follow. See if the other expert did that. If not, there's the line of attack. What really makes for effective cross-examination is for you to see what facts the opposite expert relied on. Now remember, expert opinion cannot be given in a vacuum. It doesn't stand on its own. What gives it substance are the facts that the expert relies on. And that's where the difference comes in, because each expert gets a different set of facts. Um, test the witness by varying the facts, okay? They are based on facts established by other witnesses. And very often, the facts used by the expert were given to them by the attorney. And that may not be accurate. And there's another uh, lesson in there. When you instruct an expert, make sure you instruct the expert with a correct set of facts. Uh, same story, know when to stop. Okay, I'm coming to the final argument. The first rule, you have to prepare a set of documents. Number one, concise heads of argument. I told you, I don't care what you're arguing come with heads of argument. I was in the urgent court last week and I actually saw a judge say to a counsel in an unopposed urgent, I'd like to get some heads here. I'm not, I don't really understand why you want this um, relief or this interdict. So I'll stand the matter down can you give me some short heads? So heads work everywhere. That's the one thing. Heads of argument, 
as you know, in appeals and certain opposed motions, reviews, they are compulsory. You have to file them. Okay. You need a chronology document for the argument. The best way to do it is when you hand up heads, hand up a chronology document or even attach it to your heads. Now, a trial judge is different to a motion court judge or an appeal judge or a review judge. The trial judge is actually steeped in the case. They know a lot about the case, okay? Your job is to persuade the judge that your case must succeed. Now, the argument must be short. Lengthy argument doesn't work. When you rise to your feet, the first thing, tell the judge what issue has to be decided. By now, the issue may have changed. Whereas you started with three issues, now there's one left. Now, the next, the, there's, a, there's a logical sequence to this. First, tell the judge, this is the issue. Now tell the judge, this is how I want you to decide the, that issue in my favor. And thirdly, tell the judge, what is the remedy that you want? So up front, you're basically telling the judge, here are, this is what I want from you, okay? It must be clear, keep it clear, keep it short, always be relevant, and there must be logic. You know, this is something that's ignored by practitioners. Everything you write must have a logical sequence. Each sentence must follow the preceding one. The line of reasoning must be, must be visible. You must be able to see the point the first time you read it. That's good writing, okay? This book of mine on drafting tells you how to write using logic. I've got a chapter in there on how to apply logic, okay? Read it. Judges do not need you... The judges don't need you to tell them what the law is. What judges want is to listen, hear from you about the findings of fact. Now they want to see your reasoning. Because remember, the law comes after the, the fact finding is done. Now the process is very simple. First, absorb the fact. What valid inferences can be drawn from those facts? That's very important. Now look at the available applicable law. Now apply the law to the heads, to the facts. Then make submissions why you should win. Now, when it comes to dealing with witnesses in a trial, the most important thing that a trial lawyer does is to provide comment. The last thing you want to do is repeat the evidence for, for the judge. Judge has heard the evidence. Judge wants to hear comment. Tell the judge why this is a credible witness. Tell the judge why this witness must be believed. Tell the judge why your opponent's witness must be disbelieved. That's your job, okay? Tell the judge, make submissions why you should win based on your version of the fact. And, and there's a neat comment there. Witnesses present the facts. Now you don't have to repeat the facts to the judge, he's heard it. Your job is to present comment. Begin with a, a usual, to draft heads, there's a useful method here. And I deal with it very comprehensively in this book. Have a very short introduction, five lines. Basically say what the nature of the matter is provide a short background, again, very short because the judge has heard all the evidence. Now you present a statement of the issues. The heading will be issues on trial and say, what are the issues? One, two. Now say what you want the court to find in respect of each of those issues. Next step, provide a statement of the main points you will rely on. Just state the points, don't give argument, just state the point. Then you take each point, use the point as a heading, and now you present argument. What is argument? You are justifying your stance 
with the reference to the facts and the law. Now, this is where you put in the law. And finally, devote a chap chapter to the remedy or relief you want, including the question of costs. A very good habit is to prepare draft orders and hand that up. Right. That ends the presentation. And as usual, I'm going to remind you of two things. One, if you're lazy, don't be a trial lawyer, OK? Be a hairdresser. Number two, if you want to improve your literacy skills, which you need, you need top class literacy skills, go and read a book a month. Seriously, if you're not doing that, you're not gonna be a good lawyer. You can be a fairly decent conveyancer, mind you, but you're never gonna be a trial lawyer. And let me tell you, there is nothing more rewarding in the whole of the legal profession than to be a trial lawyer, okay? Well, you can be good at drafting contracts and doing mergers and so on, but there's nothing that gives you a buzz like winning a trial. Seriously, there's nothing like it. It's actually addictive. You'll start enjoying yourself. And that's the whole thing, you see. Okay, is there time for questions, Samantha? Yes, it is. Thank you, Africa Hussein, for another very informative and sometimes hilarious presentation. Your last remark about being a hairdresser, really. <laughs> well, it seems like, you've got a, seems like you've got a good one. Ah, yes. Yeah, uh, and I bet she doesn't read a book a month. Uh, no, it's a he, and uh, I'm sure yeah. he does. Magazine. <laughs> okay. Uh, to our attendees, we trust you found that very helpful. We are gonna go on to the Q&A right now, but please take a few seconds to complete the poll that's gonna be on your screen in a few seconds. Um, it is very important, like we said. Um, I'm gonna get onto the questions. There's been some really nice questions, Osma. Right. I'm gonna go, there's one here. How does one deal with one with own expert witness who is not in agreement with the opposing expert witness on material issues? How do you deal with, with your own expert? Your own expert was not in agreement with the opposing expert witness on material issues. Oh, that's simple. They, they have to meet because the directives say the witnesses, the experts must meet. They must hold a conference. They must minute those areas that they agree. Sometimes they agree on everything, but this question is a good one. What happens when they don't agree? Your expert doesn't agree with that expert and vice versa. Then the experts must, must state the area of disagreement in the joint minutes. These joint minutes are then put in the court file. The lawyers get together and they agree on the issue uh, for, the, for the experts. And then the agreement is that they will call the expert to deal only with that part, part of their opinion, where they disagree. In the opening statement, you tell the judge, we will be calling witnesses. In fact, in Gauteng, uh, you have to tell the registrar, you, call, you, may, you may be using uh, experts when you, when you issue the papers. So your case number will start with a capital E. So the judge knows experts are coming. Tell the judge there, there will be two experts, then tell the judge where the area of dispute is and that you will be calling them on that issue. And you may even refer the judge to the pretrial minutes where you recorded that. That's how you deal with it. Right. Okay, the next one. Okay. Um, is there any technique in limiting your case to the number of days allocated without compromising your case? My past experience has been that some of my cases dragged on longer than allocated especially when the witness became tedious in his or her testimony. Okay. You shouldn't um, exceed your, your case, um, your, your estimated duration of a case. Under case management, um, you will be asked to make an estimate. There are a whole lot of directives in Gauteng 
which you won't find in any other province regarding the duration of the trial. So if your trial is going to run for more than four days, you have to write to the judge president and say, this is a case that will run for more than four days. Give the estimate 10 days or seven days so that the judge can find you a judge who is available for those days. The problem in the other divisions is that you make an estimate. If you don't finish, it means your matter becomes part heard. And that's a disaster. You don't want that. How do you, how do you accurately assess this? Make sure, firstly, you must know what the tribal issue is. You must know where each witness fits in. Keep the witness relevant. Now, witnesses only become tedious because the lawyers don't control them. That the fault is with the lawyers, not with the witness. The witness will answer the question. If you ask correctly, if you stay relevant, keep it short and sharp. If you give the witness uh, uh, an opportunity to ramble on, some of them will. But there should be no such thing as a tedious witness who is consuming court time unnecessarily. That is now taboo. You don't do it. And if that does happen, where your witness goes on and on and it's tedious and it's taking more time than you expected, that's the lawyer's fault. I'm sorry, that, that's, that's bad preparation, poor technique. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, this is from Evans Mashile. What must happen to practitioners when rule 41A, the mediation report, becomes completely different from case management issues? that a trial court must deal with? Um, look, the, 41, um, the Rule 41A processes, process is meant to run parallel to a trial. You don't conflate the two. So if something happens in, in a Rule 41, which is basically court annexed mediation, that should not adversely affect what happens in the trial. So if, if the mediation takes a totally different direction, it means that the parties must then settle. If they don't settle, they need to go back and look at what, what they're fighting about in court. That may require you to tell the judge that this is what has transpired. We may have to amend the pleadings and so on. Invariably, it re results in a postponement. It's not what you want, okay? My advice is start 41 proceedings when you issue the summons as it was intended. If you, by the time you get to trial, you should know whether there's any prospect or not. And you should know from the minutes or the, of, of the mediation that, um, that the issues have taken a different turn. Now, remember, when you go into 41A proceedings, you are supposed to sign an agreement to mediate. The, the agreement between the parties must contain the issues that require mediation. And those issues should not be different from the issues that, that appear when, the trial, when pleadings closed or, that, or the issues that you anticipate will happen when pleadings close, okay? So um, rule 41, the rule 41A processes must precede the trial preparation. Then you'll get it right. Now, obviously, especially in family law cases, you could start the trial and there may be some uh, stupid argument over custody or some element of custody what the judge will expect you to do is stop the hearing, go and discuss it outside, settle it, get a mediator, okay? But it really, this kind of problem really happens in uh, commercial disputes. It, it, it's really the fa family law that, uh, the, that, that has this problem. Uh, by the way, there's a very good write-up on Rule 41A in the Lexus Nexus's PG um, a product, the, pra the, 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 the practical guidance. Okay. Okay, I was saying this is a very practical question from Bridgeter Schwartz. 
It is, would it be a good idea to add tabs on the bundle to make documents easier to find or is index and pagination sufficient? No. When you run it, look, index and pagination is something you have to do. That's the rule, that's a directive. You must have indexing and paginating. But to flag them makes it so much easier in court. You're not shuffling paper, you just lift the tab, tabbed page, and it's done. As a practical suggestion, just do it, okay? It works in court. Any others? Yeah. Yes, there's a question from David von der Mova. Would you recommend larger fonts for pleadings? No, uh, stick, to, no, no uh, stick to the to what the rules require. The rules tell you what font, and I think they'll tell you it must not be uh, less than 10 and not more than 12. Uh, just stick to that, double spacing. Um, what I would recommend is that your chronology document for each witness, use a bigger font there, because it's going to be in front of you when you lead the witness, and you must be able to read it easily, OK? Right. OK, I think we have time for one more question. This is from Petrus mm -hmm. Pronier. Um, Advocate Hussain, is there a similar practice in civil matters, like in criminal trials, about the admissibility of evidence or documents to be decided in a trial within a trial? Uh, sorry, the first part? Is, it... is there a similar practice in civil matters like in criminal trials about yeah. the admissibility of evidence? Well, in the, in the past, there was a big difference. Now, we have introduced case management into, civil into criminal trials. What this requires is the same as in a civil trial, where the parties are meant to meet in case conferences, either in a pre-trial conference or a case conference with a with a, with a case manager, what we call judicial case conferences. In those conferences, you are expected to reach agreement on the admissibility of documents. Where you can't agree, there must be a good reason for it. And it, is, and it will be usually because the admissibility of the document is one of the issues in the trial. So, you are expected to, to, to reach agreement so that you don't waste court time proving a document. And that has now become a practice in the civil court, in the criminal courts as well. Okay, I think we're gonna squeeze one more question here. This is mm -hmm. from Peter um, Zazela. Is it correct to say that the witness chron chron chronology document would be different from the chronology document given to the judge in, in that the latter would be skeletal? or would the document given to the judge also contain the narrative you aim to adopt when leading a witness in evidence? Yeah, there's a difference between the document you give the witness, that's the witness chronology, and you can even hand up the witness chronology to the judge, so I have a copy for the judge. The difference being this, the chronology on the witness chronology is a chronology of the events that the witness talks about in the version that they will present to court. The chronology for the trial is a chronology of all the material facts that you will present in your combined version. So your whole version is in the trial, uh, is in the, in the chronology for the trial, which you hand up to the judge in opening statement. So there's a difference in the two. Thank you, Advocate Hussain. Thank you. I think we've reached the end of today's session. Thank you very much for once again sharing your insights and expertise with us. Um, Good. The panelists, uh, to the uh, attendees, please note that the recording will be made available to you within a few days. And we thank you all for joining us and we hope you found the session useful. Um, I'm now going to announce the winner of the book of Advocate Hussain's called Practical Drafting Skills. And this and the winner is Suposito Zazela. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, and, and he wins the book because of his um, avid, um, uh, <laughs> he, he asked a lot of questions. He was, he was very active on the Q&A. So well done. Um, 
we will get in touch with you. We have your uh, details. Okay. Well, Thank well you done. very much. Congratulations. Oh, I think we, uh, we you will see there's a special right. chat at the moment. Please feel free to go through it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Advocate Hussain. Thank you. Thank you for attending. <laughs> Bye. Uh, uh, one question while well, people ask yeah. if you're going to do a course on trial advocacy. Look, my, my book on trial advocacy should come out, you know, depending on all the delays you get from Lexus, um, I'll, will come out sometime, hopefully early next year. I've written most of it. Um, I have trained as a trial advocacy trainer with the English bar, Australian bar, American bar, Scottish bar, and of course, our bar. So I have, I've, I've done a lot of training in the discipline and you will find that book very useful. It should come up soon. Right. Advocate Hussain, why don't you tell the uh, attendees about the special, like any special parts of the book that hasn't, is not found anywhere else? Yeah, look, I'll tell you, um, this book does something unique. For every technique you use in court, I don't explain it to you without first explaining what the judge is looking for. So it's, it's very judge uh, centered around the judge. So we'll, for, ex for example, I'll tell you what is the, um, wh what are the things a judge is looking for in evidence in chief? So it's useful for you as a practitioner to know what the judge is looking for and the perspective of the judge, and then you present. Um, so you'll be focused on persuading the judge. And that's what the book does. Um, and uh, oh, uh, it's taken a while to write. Um, so, no one's it either. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, someone says they want to see the cover of the book. This is the cover of the book. You will see that it's a big book. The reason we made a big book is so it's user friendly. It's easy to use. And I must tell you, oh, by the way, it's a prescribed book now by the LPC. And uh, the, the, the attorneys love it because of the size. They, they find it's easier to work with. They can write notes on it and so on. They, um, and by the way, it's a lot of fun to read. Um, it's not a boring read. Mm. Okay, yeah. you have the same. Thank right. you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye. Okay. bye.